I'm Scott Al Miller. It is the 19th of November, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Latin America, and we are still here in Cochabamba, Bolivia. We are up here on the roof of the apartment building that I've been staying at this week and will be staying at uh, more today. And I'm gonna give some outdoor tours in just a little bit, but I wanted to do kind of a Bolivia housekeeping episode today. I'm not gonna walk around for this episode because one, I have these great views behind me. This is fantastic and a great opportunity to come up here and use a different space. Uh, which I'm going to give you a tour of. Uh, but I also wanted, uh, I have a very tight schedule today because of some meetings and switching apartments and everything. So I'm going to use a little bit of this time to go over a little bit of what we've learned about Bolivia, my impressions of things uh, so far after being here for about a week. I hope you guys are enjoying the content. We're going to get to all of this about Bolivia and an Airbnb tour of my second apartment here, as well as this top space right after the bump. We're doing a more traditional episode today where I'm, I'm just standing with the camera and not exploring the city, but we will explore the city more. I will try very hard. And we are heading to La Paz in just a few days. So we're gonna be getting content from there as well. I may do a little bit of a pause in the middle of these episodes and cover a couple like Q and A's uh, just because it, it allows me to get the episodes uploaded more quickly. And that's the biggest thing that I'm challenged with right now. If you watch the episodes up till today, I did a lot of walking around and that walking around, the last day of just uploading the videos from the GoPro took basically 24 hours. It had to run all through the night, all evening, and I really don't have time to, to have the camera accessible to me because it's spending so much time uploading. So it's, it really is a bit of a challenge, but things are working. Now I'm moving to the new apartment in just a few hours, so I don't really know how it's gonna be working after this point. So we're taking our chances. I have an Airbnb just for one day uh, here, additionally in Cochabamba, and I'll show that to you. And I then am moving tomorrow to La Paz, uh, where I have another Airbnb for the rest of my time. And then it's from La Paz, I'll be flying back home for my daughter's quinceanera. Uh, all right, so Bolivia. Bolivia is really interesting and amazing. It's in the heart of South America, and that's actually its, its slogan. Uh, and I think that it is a big surprise country. This is like Nicaragua. Bolivia is one of those countries that people know extremely little about. And that makes it a really interesting travel destination because there's just, there's very few flight paths coming into it. Uh, if you're an American, you have to have a visa. It's not hard to get, but it is $160. And any country that lists as needing a visa just automatically gets a lot less tourism traffic from the United States or anywhere that it needs a visa from. And, and it's hard to get here. There aren't easy flights necessarily coming into the country and the flights that do typically all go into uh, Santa Cruz de la Sierra, which is not the place in the country you want to go. And the extreme altitude of much of the country makes it uh, formidable to a lot of people because the risk or the reality of altitude sickness uh, can be a real barrier as well. Some people can't handle, even here in Cochabamba, many can't handle going to La Paz and its upper barrio of El Alto is off limits to just about everyone at 14 15,000 feet, so that's very extreme. But it is a really interesting area. So of all the countries in South America, or anywhere in the world, I suppose, Bolivia is the most Andean country, maybe tied with Chile. This is a country that is exists up in the mountains. The majority of the population lives high in the mountains. And, and so mountain Andean culture, both historically and in modern times, define the Bolivian experience, but it also is a very large country and, and borders a number of places and does have a bit of the Amazon basin. So you have this interesting mix, but definitely the Andes is what defines what we think of as Bolivia very strongly. Unlike a lot of the countries in South America, although all have some degree of this, Bolivia is much more embracing and connected to its indigenous heritage than uh, other countries are. And so uh, there are many official languages, those alternative languages, or I shouldn't call them alternative, the indigenous languages, alternatives to Spanish, I should say, uh, are, are taught in schools. They're an important part of the culture. They're used as a part of the heritage here. Everyone learns them. Everyone uh, knows how to speak something pretty much. Everyone is a little bit strong, but they're taught in school. So it's, it's very uh, ubiquitous. 
uh, those kinds of things make it feel very different than a lot of other former Spanish colonies that have uh, embraced being colonial quite a bit more or have a larger population that came from Europe. Here, the majority of the population did not come from Europe, and you really feel that in the in the culture, in the experience, in the way that Bolivia approaches the world. Uh, so Bolivia is very set apart from uh, its neighbors in South America. It is uh, not a partner with very many of the countries in North America, uh, and of all the places in the Americas, even more so than, say, Nicaragua, Bolivia is very tightly tied to China, uh, culturally and historically and politically. They do a ton of business with China. So you're going to find Chinese products here uh, in, in volumes and brands you've never heard of before. Uh, there are so many things that you can buy in the stores here that aren't uh, readily available in other countries. It's very interesting to see that um, because it's uh, in Peru to quite some degree as well. Peru possibly has the greatest connections to Asia in general but Bolivia certainly has the greatest connections to China itself in the Americas. Um, and that's something that a lot of people aren't, aren't prepared for. When you come into Peru, signs in, in Chinese and signs in Japanese all over the place. Uh, and here in Bolivia, there's just so much connection to China. Uh, but it makes it a really interesting location that it's, it's so different than anywhere else you're likely to go, anywhere else that exists. There's nothing like Bolivia, and that that's important, right? If you're coming here, it's not just another South American country in any way whatsoever. Of course, it shares characteristics with Peru, especially in Argentina, to quite some degree, but it is very much a unique country as well. I had to move to get the sun off of the lens as it moves. We're very much approaching midday and the sun is intense. I can feel my head burning through my hat. So <laughs> I have to be a little bit careful. But it is, it is a beautiful day. It is so clear, but it is, it is rather warm and the sun burns regardless of the air temperature. The air temperature is nice, but the sun is, is heavy. Uh, and, and being at 8,000 feet, that's just how it is, right? You're going to get a lot of ultraviolet, so that's something you've got to be aware of. I mentioned that on the, on the walks. Uh, one of the things that is um, interesting about Bolivia is that this is a very low cost of living country, which is always a great thing, right? My viewers especially tend to really be excited about low cost of living countries. Uh, that's what often brings you to uh, look at Nicaragua, which is where I live. And so if you're if you're watching this show and you're seeing me in Bolivia, I live in Nicaragua. Uh, and, and there's a lot of comparisons we can do to Nicaragua. Bolivia and Nicaragua are very friendly countries with each other. But they don't do a lot of business because of the, the distance and uh, Bolivia doesn't produce very many things that Nicaragua is looking for. And Nicaragua doesn't produce a lot of things, right? Mostly they produce food uh, and you don't need to ship food to Central South America, right? It's just it doesn't make sense. Um, it's, it's also worth noting just in general, uh, if, if you've never looked at a map, Bolivia is landlocked. Uh, traditionally, it did have a, a port on the sea that was taken by Chile a number of years ago. I'm not going to get into the politics of why the war happened and, and who was right, who was wrong, or how it should have gone. But for the, for quite some time now, Bolivia has been cut off from the sea, but they are friendly with Chile, and Chile does allow them to use the port, but they do not have any ports of their own. That means that everything here in Bolivia is either brought in by train, which is very lengthy uh, distance-wise, because in physical length, uh, because of the Andes. They have to go way out and around or it is brought in by bus over the mountains, or it is flown in by plane. So that makes uh, purchasing things take longer to get here and be just everything's more expensive because shipping is so much more of a hassle compared to even Nicaragua, which has many logistical challenges, but does have a deep water port on the Pacific and is putting in a deep water port on the Atlantic. Uh, Nicaragua is just in much better shape for that. But the airports here in Bolivia are much busier, partially because of that, right? So more things are centered on, on the air travel. And of course, there are no trains bringing in from another country in Nicaragua. So Bolivia has that going for it as well. But Bolivia is a low cost of living country, um, but it's important to understand that every country that is low cost has a completely different balance. If you're going to go to a Thailand or a Nicaragua, right, as examples that we know, um, the, the things that are expensive and the things that are cheap and what you get for your money are vastly different. So while you can live very cheaply in Nicaragua and you can live very cheaply in Thailand, what that living like is incredibly different. In Thailand, you would have a, a very small apartment, but you would be able to go to fancy restaurants. And in Nicaragua, you would have an enormous house, but you'd have no accessibility to variety of food or large restaurants. The, those kinds of things really change what it's like. Um, Thailand in general is very urbane. Uh, Nicaragua is extremely not urbane. It's much more agrarian. Uh, those things are, you feel very heavily between different countries. And it's something that I don't think people articulate very often. And coming to Bolivia, Bolivia is uh, a, a large physical country, very physically large, with enormous empty areas spread all throughout it. And then 
extremely large population centers. So Cochabamba and La Paz and Santa Cruz are all cities that their conurbations are, are significantly north of two million people. And no one really knows how big they are. It is possible that they're in three or four million marks. There's no really solid census and it's hard to know exactly where the city starts and stops. Most things just indicate the city limits, which means nothing. You're completely, go see my video on why city limits is a meaningless measure. Um, and, and right here in Cochabamba is a perfect example. If you look out and you see these views and you say, well, this is obviously one solid city and it clearly delimitates at the end. Like you get to the end of the city and it just stops. So you're like, you look at this and you're like, it's clear what the city is. It's actually four separate cities and tons of villages. And so when you're looking at the population on Wikipedia or something of Cochabamba, it's actually just a little area cut out of the middle of this and a whole bunch of what you're seeing isn't counted. And that's very confusing because obviously people who live here have no idea that they've left Cochabamba according to Wikipedia. Media. So understanding what the population is, how it interacts, uh, requires you to kind of understand these conurbations anywhere in the world, right? But here in Bolivia, they tend to be very big and dense and then end quickly and just go to kind of nothing. Um, and so because of that, it is a very urbane existence. Cities tend to be dense and it's difficult to sometimes articulate exactly what I mean by urbane, but when you get to a place like Bolivia, you will instantly know, right? When you're in Nicaragua, you come even coming into Managua, you're like, ah, it's like a big sprawling village. You never have like a big downtown. You never have that city feel, that city life. Um, and when you go to a Cochabamba or a uh, Guatemala city or Mexico city, uh, something like that, you instantly are like, like, whoa, there's the high rises and there's the art galleries and there's the all the restaurants on the street and people sitting out at cafes and all these things that we naturally associate with large cities, but we don't really put our fingers on necessarily exactly what it is that makes it feel that way. But when you're walking around Cochabamba, as you've seen in my videos, it feels like a large city. These these fancy coffee shops and fancy uh, clothing shops and, and big name brands and all this variety sitting right on the street and and in the bottom of buildings with residential above and um, you know modern apartments and just all these things you expect from a big city and Nicaragua does not have it all right <laughs> even in the places where you would expect it uh, downtown Managua or parts of uh, Matagalpa it doesn't really exist it may just start to hint at it but it never really happens you do get beautiful houses and amazing places to live and Nicaragua has great living opportunities but it'll never give you the feeling that you get from a major city City, such as Cochabamba. Um, now, Cochabamba is probably at least twice the size of Managua, so that alone makes it feel much more that way. And we get the same feeling more or less when we go to uh, Costa Rica, to San Jose, Costa Rica, which is also uh, nearly twice the size uh, of Managua. Um, but even there, you don't get the level of city that you get here in Cochabamba, but it's much closer. Um, and that's uh, for Alan and Anna, who came in uh, yesterday, uh, and even just coming in at night and not getting very much time in the city, they immediately experienced that this was a totally different thing, that this was big cities, that this was very urban, and that you were your lifestyle is different. And that's the biggest thing, is that when you live in the big cities like this versus the small city village lifestyle of Nicaragua, you get two very different ways of approaching life. Um, and, and for some people, I think going to a Nicaragua um, at, at roughly the same cost of living, they're going to, to absolutely fall in love. Be like, that's what I want. I love this, this more rural, more village feel everywhere I go. And here in Bolivia, you're gonna get the kind of an extreme opposite. Oh, it's just big city everywhere you go. Of course, you can go to downtown Managua and get a little bit of the urbane in Nicaragua. And of course, in Bolivia, there are villages spread out throughout the country. You could go to those. Um, but in Nicaragua, those little villages represent the country itself. They represent the bulk of the population. They have really good internet. They have all those resources. In Bolivia, I suspect if you start getting out into those really remote areas, you're gonna not have good power supplies. You're not gonna have good water. You're not gonna have internet because it is not how the people live, right? Those are the exceptions, not the rule. Whereas in Nicaragua, they're very much the rule. Um, so for, for some people, um, I think you're get, uh, and, and this is probably true of a lot of the people who come to Nicaragua and say, well, it's not really for me, right? A big part of that is this lack of city. And um, if you come to Bolivia, you may have the opposite. Some people who like everything about Nicaragua, but they can't put their finger on what this missing element is, may come to a Bolivia and say, wow, oh, this big city, this is, this is the feel, right? I think Alan and Anna got either a little bit of that's what they want or a little bit of that's what they haven't had in a long time, uh, and so they miss it, right? 
Um, so that can happen too, right? You just need to figure out how to visit places. And that's why I want to have an apartment in Guatemala City because it's very close to Nicaragua. I can live in Nicaragua. But when I get that urge to go to the big city and have that feeling, um, Guatemala City is, is bigger than the two, whatever the two largest cities are in, in Bolivia combined are still smaller than Guatemala City. So the feeling that Guatemala City gives you is extreme in that way. Very modern, very urban. Um, and, and so uh, I, I understand that. Um, it's something that affects me significantly when I'm um, looking at places to live. I very much like that style. And so uh, Bolivia very much uh, appeals to me, um, especially with this incredibly low cost of living. So the thing about Bolivia versus Nicaraguan cost of living, and some of it's caused by this cultural difference, city versus village, but it's um, in Nicaragua, the cost of housing is extremely low. It is, it is mind boggling how cheap housing is, whether it's rent or to purchase in Nicaragua. It's just, it's, it's as cheap as it gets. And in Bolivia, it is certainly not expensive to have housing, but it is uh, noticeably more expensive than Nicaragua. You also can get things you can't get in Nicaragua, right? Super modern apartments in endless variety, um, big ones, little ones, studios, super modern, middle of the big city, all kinds of things. That's one of the reasons why it costs more. It offers those things and Nicaragua doesn't, but uh, it also, just even finding things that are roughly comparable, you're going to spend a little bit more here uh, in Bolivia, or you're more likely to spend about the same, but get less for it, right? You're gonna get smaller apartments, much less square footage and, and that sort of thing. That's the natural um, kind of way that it works out. And that's true in most big cities, like that's not a surprising thing. Uh, what is, I think, really surprising here in Bolivia is that the cost of food and the variety of food uh, is extremely good. Nicaragua has very high quality food, but the variety is ridiculously low. It's one of the lowest of any places I've ever been. It is unlikely that you're going to find a large variety of restaurants in Nicaragua that are going to uh, satisfy, especially an American palate, desiring um, a number of different flavors, of different styles, of different nationalities, things that we're very used to coming from the U.S. or Canada or Mexico, uh, Western Europe. Um, you're going to, you're used to just, oh, I want to go to an Indian restaurant, I want to go to a Chinese restaurant, I want to go to a, a Thai restaurant, I want to go to a Mexican restaurant, I want to go to whatever, right? You can just go from thing to thing All, in any city, anywhere. Most villages give you a bunch of variety, right? And, and here you have the same thing. Cochabamba is just loaded with food of all kinds of varieties. Vegan is a little bit hard to find. Definitely exists. We went to a few places, but there's not this huge variety of it. That's that's unfortunate. But but there is just a lot of general variety of food and a lot of different venues, and a lot of different styles. You can um, you know very very hip urban places, very rustic chill places, very just sit on the street normal. Like you have all that variety, and, and Nicaragua lacks that. So. Cochabamba brings, or, or Bolivia in general, brings this big variety of food, but does so at lower cost than in Nicaragua. So your actual cost of eating is less. So roughly, and we've, we've done this over a number of years, looked because I have multiple teams here in Nicaragua, I'm sorry, here in Bolivia, and I have teams in Nicaragua, sorry, and, and in comparing the two for cost of living overall, they're generally considered to be extremely comparable. It's just that you're going to pay different amounts for different things. If you're going to cook at home all the time and really go out of your way to do really basic food, and, and Nicaragua probably gives you a slight advantage. If you want to go out and do lots of interesting things and, and travel around and, and get a great variety, then, then Bolivia is probably going to have a cost advantage. And if you're kind of a normal person, that it just has a normal blend of things, you're probably going to find them to cost roughly the same. In just one, you're going to pay more for your housing and more for your transit, and the other, you're going to pay more for your food, and uh, that evens out over time, more or less. Now, some people, if you eat twice as much as a normal person, well, then that's going to shift the benefit to places with cheaper food, obviously. If you eat extremely little, then it's going to shift places to cheaper uh, benefit to places with cheaper housing, for example. It's just natural things. So there's a lot of factors that affect you personally, um, what your lifestyle is, how much you eat, whether you like to cook at home, all those things. Uh, but just as real basic, super general numbers, they're actually incredibly comparable in cost of living, which is really interesting that you can go between these two completely different places in totally different parts of the world and with basically the same budget, live very well and very comparably, but in very different ways. The weather here in Bolivia is really nice. Being almost on the equator, you get even weather year round. So whatever city you choose, basically you're not gonna have variations in seasons. That will vary a little bit from city to city, but overall it is very, very mild. Uh, and if you go to a city and, and decide that it's something that you like, you're probably going to be able to keep that all year round, which is for me a huge benefit and very similar to how we are in Nicaragua. Just in Nicaragua, we're very hot and relatively humid. And here in Bolivia, in general, it leans towards dry and not nearly as hot. Here in Cochabamba, it is uh, very mild. It's kind of a 
light summer, a little bit on the on the warmer than a spring day, but not a hot summer day uh, year round. And up in La Paz, it is a little bit chilly year round. So just a little bit of differences there, but you can kind of pick where you want to be. Santa Cruz is extremely warm. In many days, it's going to be warmer than uh, Nicaragua, warmer than Leon or Chinandega. Uh, when we flew in, they're expecting it to be at 99 degrees. Right, and it is it is mid-November, so <laughs> this is definitely not a time that you expect to be hitting nearly 100 degrees, uh, and it can get very warm, and it's very humid and smoggy down there, whereas up here it is dry and clear. So just little differences there that uh, it's a big country, right? And I think a lot of people often make this mistake of thinking that a country has a weathered pattern, right? What it, now Nicaragua is so small and Panama is so small, uh, you tend to be able to say what is what is the temperature, what is the weather like in those countries? And of course, people know there's a little bit of variation from town to town, but in general, you can you can generalize those countries very well. Bolivia, you can generalize that there's no seasons, but generalizing whether it's a warm or a cold country, you can't do it all. T the two largest cities vary from extremely hot and, and quite cold uh, all year round. So th that's that, that, that's a very high level um, of disparity between those two things. Also, so uh, people need to know what the time zone is here. So this is like most of the world does not honor daylight savings time. So it is a standard time that does not move. And if you're watching this at about the time that I'm recording it, the United States and Canada are not in daylight savings time either. They're in standard time. Uh, they also, so daylight savings is also known as summertime. I covered this recently because the time changed. So we're sometimes uh, regular time is sometimes referred to as winter time just because people can't remember when things are. So summertime is daylight savings and winter time is standard. So so right now the U.S. is in standard and uh, Bolivia is always standard, Nicaragua is always standard. Nicaragua lines up with central time. So when it's standard in the U.S., not daylight, uh, Nicaragua is the same as Chicago and Dallas and Houston, those cities. Uh, Eastern time, uh, New York City, Miami, those line up with Peru, which I flew through to get here. That is west of Bolivia. Peru is one of the very few places in South America that has Eastern time because South America is always farther east than you think it is. I don't care how far east you think it is. It is farther. Trust me, stare at a map all day. It'll still be farther east than your brain will let you think that it is. There's something weird about the way that it sits on a map and where we've been taught to look at maps. It never feels as far east as it is. The eastern point of Brazil is practically under Portugal, which makes a lot of sense because it was uh, colonized by the Portuguese. And uh, uh, Peru is under New York, and it's just, it's all wacky. Uh, and, and the size of it is, it really throws you off. One of the things that I find most interesting is Brazil, which is just over there, I believe, uh, right there. If you were to go to the northern point of Brazil and, and draw, you know, with a compass and say, what is the, the nearest point of Canada, and then draw a compass and see uh, what the distance is to the farthest southern point of Brazil, the northernmost point of Brazil is closer to Canada than it is to the southernmost point of Brazil. That's how big Brazil is. If you were to fly from Canada to just over the edge of Brazil, that would be a shorter flight than flying from nor the northern point of Brazil to the southern point. Nuts. Absolutely nuts. So a lot of things down here are just much bigger than you think. So Bolivia sits east of Peru, so it is in what North Americans refer to as Atlantic time, and some people refer to as maritime time. Uh, this is the same time zone that is used by the uh, Canadian provinces, such as uh, Nova Scotia and um, uh, Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island, that area out there one hour east of Eastern time. Uh, and so if you are like me and going between Nicaragua and here, it's a two hour difference. If you're coming from New York, it's a one hour difference. There's nowhere in the US that uses the time zone that Bolivia has, it is just farther to the east. So that's, that takes a little bit to get used to. Everything is happening here a little bit early, um, which gives it kind of that European feeling, just the tiniest bit, that Eastern Canada feeling. Uh, so when we're here, I'm getting up early just naturally, uh, just because of the way things are here. I have a tendency to get uh, sleepy early uh, and then get up a little bit on the early side. Uh, and, and that's weird because, you know, jet lag should have pushed me the opposite direction. But uh, so when I go back, it's probably going to be really weird. As I'm getting up at about six o'clock in the morning here, that's four o'clock back home in Nicaragua. So <laughs> it's uh, it's odd being that far that far ahead. Um, I also have noticed, and I don't know if this affects other people, 
but I'm, I'm here and feeling good. I'm not feeling altitude sickness at 8,000 feet. I really believe I will at 12,000 when I go to La Paz. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not being cocky. I'm just, it's gone really well here uh, in Cochabamba, but I gone out and did a bit of walking. Yesterday, I actually did nine kilometers and didn't have any problems. Sometimes I would run and be like, ooh, yeah, you, you run out of air a little bit faster than uh, you used to, but um, able to do quite a bit without a problem. So nine kilometer day, I was out feeling good and uh, one of the things that really hit me is that uh, it really encourages me. Just the, the weather, the everything going on in, in Cochabamba, at least, makes me feel like I want to go out and be active. And a lot of other people are, too. There's a lot of people outside jogging, walking in the parks, just hanging out outside. It's a very outdoor city, which is fantastic. Um, but it, I've also noticed that I have extremely little appetite. Uh, for the last couple days, I've only had one meal per day, and I'm going for smaller meals. Last night, we went out for veggie burgers. It was my only meal of the day. I did also have a croissant thing. It wasn't really a croissant. I was not super impressed, honestly, with the croissant thing that I had. It was totally edible. They did a nice job with it, but like making the bread, the bread is, so far I've not had any bread that I'm impressed by in Bolivia. It's all been it's not not a bread country uh, for me so far. No one, no one has produced anything that I've been impressed by. Um, but but there's a lot of it. Uh, but uh, going out for dinner last night was just a veggie burger. And they said, do you want the full size one or the small one? I'm like, I just want the small. There was a kid size. I was even smaller. I didn't do that. But did a small one and got french fries. And they didn't give me that big of an order of french fries. And I still didn't finish them all. Uh, most, but not quite all. So that was it. And the day before, only one meal. And that was a veggie burger. We really liked that veggie burger. So we tried another one. The second one wasn't as good. The first one was amazing. We went to Mente. And it's an all vegan restaurant. And, and I got the, the lentil burger. Wow, was it good. We also got uh, barbecue cauliflower um, alitas. That was amazing too. So we've had some really good food, but two days in a row, all I've had is one small to medium sized vegetarian vegan meal. Um, and I'm feeling completely full. It is coming up on noon and I've had no food today whatsoever. And I'm in no way hungry. Um, I've not hit the coffee yet. I'm going to do that shortly and grab some. I'm just about to get picked up by Ozzy. I'm going to check out of my Airbnb as soon as this video is done. Um, I'm going to head over to Alan's Airbnb, which is right around the corner, just over there. Uh, we're going to do a meeting. I'm going to drop off some stuff and then I'm going to hopefully do a, um, a walk around with you guys and get a little bit more footage of Coach Bamba while I can on this beautiful, beautiful day. But uh, yeah, not feeling any need for food. I'm sure by dinner, by six o'clock, I'm going to be hungry. Definitely. But for now, I'm feeling great. So I'm, I'm finding this uh, Cochabamba experience to be very healthy for me from a just not eating as much and being more exercise driven, which of course, when you're traveling and you're able to go out and film things, it makes you more excited to do stuff. It's kind of natural, but um, I think overall, it's, it's really encouraging me to, uh, to have a slightly better diet. It is worth noting, being here and being at altitude, everyone says, every doctor says, you got to take uh, coca tea as just a thing that you drink. That may be an appetite suppressant, so that may be a factor uh, as to why I'm just not hungry all day. I'm not completely aware of whether it is or not in coca tea form, mate coca, but uh, it, it easily is, so that, that could be um, a reason. But everyone drinks it here. It is part of the lifestyle because of the altitude. It increases your, your oxygen flow, so it's important to have. So of course my battery died while I was doing that recording, never-ending story of my life. So coca tea is like the thing that you do here. People who live here do it all the time. Like, like daily. And when you come to visit, everyone tells you, you have to do, uh, you have to, you have to drink coca tea. This is, it increases your oxygen uptake. It is going to make you feel better. It's going to keep you from getting sick. Altitude sickness is a very real thing. Um, and, and they also have this medication that, that gives you the same effects. Uh, so the combination is generally what people recommend. It's also worth noting that because of high altitude in general, and a dry climate like Cochabamba, it is very important to be aware of dehydration. It is very easy uh, to become just, just dehydrated. Like I notice it very quickly. Um, you don't get sweaty. Uh, it, it gives you a little bit of a desert feel. Of course, we're in a drought, so it's more extreme than usual, but it's very easy to end up feeling sick just because you have not been intaking enough water. So I'm gonna show my water bottle here. This is what I buy. These are six liter water bottles and uh, just drink like crazy, you know? And that's one of the reasons why the coca tea is important is it increases your water intake, like any type of tea, especially mates. But you do want caffeine generally when you're up here as well, because that also increases your body's ability to handle oxygen. So uh, so some kind of coffee uh, or some kind of uh, 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 
guar guarana uh, drinks that really have a lot of caffeine. Those are going to be important for you. Or black tea, of course. And when you're having coca tea, that is different. It doesn't have caffeine. It doesn't give you the energizing effects. It just helps with your oxygen uptake. So if you're having coca tea and thinking, well, I don't need coffee because I had that, that's probably not the case. You're still going to need coffee because uh, you're not going to have your caffeine that you're used to. So you could go through caffeine withdrawal if you're not careful, which I have done at some points. My ride arrived right as I was finishing up that episode and I had to save the wrap up for while I'm back in Nicaragua, which gives you an idea of just how busy things have been and how much traveling around I've done. Don't worry, a lot more Bolivia content is coming in the days to come. I just had to do this little outro on, uh, on the day after I've returned to Nicaragua. So at least you know ahead of time that I safely get back to Nicaragua. No problems with that, but I wanted to wrap up this episode. Definitely, you need to stay on top of your caffeine. You need to stay very hydrated. You need to be sure to actually use the coca leaves and the uh, medicine that is provided for you there in Bolivia. The high altitude is no joke. It is very easy to end up very sick. And in the days to come, Alan and Anna will find that out, that it is pretty rough. They were just arriving at the time that we did this video. And we had not yet gone up to La Paz. Uh, and so since we're talking about it on this particular day, I just want to point out they did experience quite a bit of altitude sickness. You'll see how it went for me in those in those episodes. But it is a thing that even if you have a lot of experience at high altitude, you never know when it's going to hit you. And different uh, ways of approaching it can cause a very different effect when you get up there. So it's just important to remember that uh, it's something you have to watch. You have to be very careful with it. And there are uh, tried and true techniques that do work quite well. And we did find that when we use the medicine, when we use the coca tea, we really noticed that it made us feel better and we were able to handle the altitude pretty well. We had a very good trip. So thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That helps make this channel possible. I have a lot of expenses to do this. And as always, share this with friends, family, post on social media, anything to get the word out. I'm surprised. I'm already seeing some of the responses for the Bolivia content, and, and I thought we would get a lot of response on this, a lot of people watching uh, just because we're in a new country and doing something new, and actually it seemed a bit lower. Now, of course, I'm not busily promoting the channel because I'm out making content, uh, and so that makes it a little bit harder to get the word out just because I don't have time to do those things. But uh, if you guys could help by doing so, just let people know we're in a new country, new content, new things to see. Maybe they'd be interested in that instead of Nicaragua, which obviously I'll be back to soon enough. Uh, that would be much appreciated. As always, thanks for joining me, and I will see all of you tomorrow.